make sure I've got this plate around the right way. There's a slight recess on the edge of this black plastic piece, so make sure that the brass is sitting correctly, that it's not riding up over the top. Otherwise it'll probably foul something in the mechanism. checking that that's smooth, that action feels good, making sure I've got the block here the right way around. This is a, a later lens, so it's probably more appropriate on a Reflex 4 camera, for example, than on a Reflex 3 or S. Certainly not an S. Alright, so I'm just checking the action here. It's nice and smooth. No rubbing, it's working well. And we can start putting the pieces back in here. Just gonna give that a blow to make sure there's no dust in there from the or fragments of cotton from the cleaning process. I'll check that these little wheels, these pinions, rotate smoothly. Usually they do. If they were stiff. Uh, probably flushing those with naphtha would be the thing and if I was going to be flushing them with naphtha in this particular lens I'd remove this piece and take the plastic out completely so there was no danger of it from the solvent. As I say I used naphtha to clean this so I didn't have a problem but I wouldn't have soaked that plastic in naphtha. Okay so getting these pieces together in my traditional fashion I haven't got all the parts neatly laid out. I've got them all over the place. So it's lucky that someone knows where things go. Seems pretty good. Now this goes in this way. Your first one goes always in close to that stud where the spring runs and the spring runs from this stud to the hook, hooks onto it right there. Now the spacer ring that sits on top of that is here and I'll just run a white molybdenum paste along that edge where the spring will run. So that's seated in place. And we have the return spring. Now the return spring for the first of the pieces here is the finer of the two springs. This one usually doesn't come off the post. This time it did, which is an advantage when you're cleaning things. I'm just getting that seated over the post. It's certainly an advantage when you're cleaning things if that spring is off, because then you're not likely to damage it. But it's awkward to get off and you're more likely to damage it getting it off than the damage you'd cause leaving it there. 
Okay, so that's there. Just checking the action. This springs back nicely. We want our cam in there now. Here's our little cam. Again, you'd probably do just as well with a bit of synthetic adhesive here, a synthetic lubricant. Because this is nylon and it's probably fairly low friction anyway. So I'll drop that in there. And the second of our depth of field pointers goes needs to be cleaned and dropped in. These parts are all very clean compared to the last lens that I did. Um, why that should be, I don't know. Let's drop this in. The little pin on the cam arrangement there needs to come up through the top. And this needs to be hard against its stop. So I'm lifting it on this side, moving it over a few teeth. Another one again. Right, now that it's hard up against its stop, of course the other one's hard up against its stop, that piece is done. Okay, this piece goes on next, of course it should have a return spring attached to it which has become unattached. So I'll just clean this and we'll fight the spring into place. All of these pieces are counter rotating or rotating against each other these and they're all flat surfaces and there's not much spring tension to move anything so if there's any grease or oil on those flat surfaces you'll find that these pieces will tend to stick together okay let's get the spring hooked up into the hole there The pin on this drops into the hole on that little plastic cam. Like that. The spring needs to be brought around and that fits over the pin that the other spring is hooked up to. And this spring sits around behind this plastic fence, not on top of it, otherwise you'll have trouble. We'll clean the base and these two components. The shim. This lever. There's no rangefinder coupling, so there's no rangefinder coupling components to clean. So I'll just give this a clean, make sure there's no loose rubbish in there. And the outside too. Where's their screws that I use? They should be not far away. Here they are. These screws make a very useful alignment tool to keep that shim in place in particular while you're getting the lens base over the top. And you can tell which way up this goes. 
because there's a notches well, that goes around the screws and there's an extra hole here which lines up with that slot there and that's where a pin on the base runs through that so that piece is sitting in place this piece drops on there and the base goes in place now the holes are not evenly spaced, it'll only go on one way let's get it over the top of those screws it's catching on something on the other side have I done something wrong? I don't think so certainly something's catching it's just not seated correctly that's better I might have to flatten that shim out somewhat ok it sounds good, I'll hold it firmly between finger and thumb and we'll check that the pointers move correctly there they are they're coming up symmetrical about the centre that's where they should be so you can put the screws in place now one of these screws already has red paint on it so we'll need to make sure that goes where the red dot should be which is here OK, I've got two screws in there and I can check the, mo the movement again make sure that everything moves freely make sure that the focus is still nice and smooth that's all good the focus is certainly smoother than uh, the other two lenses were and I put that down to the use of that plastic ring instead of the wedges So there's the lens body and we really need to look at the lens capsule now ok so it's a bit dusty looking I'll blow all that dust off there there's a loose thread there let's get that off look at the rear group it's a bit dusty now you'll notice that there's a bit of Bright, a bright spot through here that's an indication that someone's had a tool on there to remove that rear group at some stage so the lens has been serviced before okay we can remove the outer helical this was not particularly stiff not like lens number two let's get this thread cleaned up I haven't had a look at the diaphragm yet or the optical qualities of that lens I'll need to make sure that the lens it's the glass is nice and clean so it means cleaning the outside of the glass and uh, looking 
at the inside of the glass. There's frequently there's no need to open the lens capsule and you certainly don't want to be opening it up for no reason at all. Sometimes you may have a problem, there may be fungus or something inside the lens that you need to get to or too much dust or something but uh, don't go looking for trouble. Okay that looks quite good, I'm going to clean that glass And particularly with the front surface like that, I'll clean it lightly to remove any loose dust and dirt. And when I'm sure that there's no grit or dust or anything on that lens I can be a little bit more be a bit harder on it uh, rubbing at any surface imperfections this lens certainly has some imperfections on the front surface I don't know if they'll show on the camera there's a patch right here and a couple of little specks around the place. And little patches like that, it's hard to tell whether it's a loose deposit on the lens or it's something that's etched into the lens. Now the glass cleaner made no impression on that little but yeah you can see it. As I move the lens backwards and forwards you can see something right there. And there's one there and one there and one there too. So what I'm going to do is take a bit of acetone on a cotton bud and see if that makes any impression on it. Just on the off chance that that uh, what I'm seeing there is some deposit that will dissolve in acetone. You'll be cautious once you get acetone near the lens because if you touch the painted surface of the mount that paint will melt with the acetone and you'll transfer that to the glass and you'll end up smearing paint all over it. Now those spots are not coming away So I would say that that's some damage to the surface of the lens. And if I was looking for a culprit, I would say that possibly some spray, salt spray in particular, would be a, uh, a good thing to blame things like that on. I'll do the rear surface now. The rear surface is nice and clean. The front surface has those little imperfections. What would the effect would they have in your photography? Well, potentially they might decrease your contrast of your image somewhat. Uh, that's only potentially, you might never notice the difference. Get this lens started on the thread, check that that cleaning was good, that certainly moves smoothly. Take my helical grease, You don't, never need to overdo the grease on a helical, it just makes it stiffer, so instead of being smooth and easy to move, it becomes smooth and difficult to move. Alright, that feels good. Take that off, check my diaphragm again. Now I noticed that on this lens, 
this tab that connects up to the lever in the uh, lens mount is more robust than the ones on the earlier cameras, earlier lenses. So it means that there's certainly been some work done there in terms of design. Perhaps they had a problem. Okay, so I'm going to give this a wipe of molybdenum paste. And likewise in that notch where it lines up with the guide post in the mount. And as before, got my finger on this one, the one that flops about, and I'm pushing that right across as far as it will go because I want that tab right round the side there. Get my lens lined up with that tab. And see if I can rotate that. Yeah, it's certainly lined up with the tab. Now I need to rotate the lens until it lines up with its guide post. Which is there and you can see that the aperture opens nicely for me. So I'll put the outer helical in place that's fine Check that I've got my focus scale ring round at the infinity position. Put the screws in. Or put one screw in to start off with anyway. Now I can put it down on the bench without it causing me grief. Again, I will adjust the focus of this lens with it mounted on my Reflex 4 because that is a very convenient way to do it. I didn't mean to do that. I'm just the screw onto the glass. Lucky it's only a small screw. Nip those three screws up, check the action of the focus, now that's not going all the way on the scale, I've got my lens too far forward, basically that's why I'm not getting the full range there, so let's just slacken these screws off, we want our lens further in than that. Let's start there. Basically I'd come beyond the close focus position, right, so now that will roll around from infinity. Right round to there, still not far enough. Okay. I think this lens may have a A longer throw than the uh, other lenses. Might have a closer, close focus position. That's better. Now it certainly runs from infinity down to the two foot mark. Right, I'll try this on the camera body and adjust the focus to suit.
Yeah, that lens doesn't come back to infinity, so it's not the lens isn't back far enough in the body. So need to slacken these screws off and move this ring to drop the lens further back into the body, like that. Let's try it there. Bit more is needed. Let's try it there. It's easier when you've gone past the infinity position because then you adjust your focus, adjust your lens until it's absolutely spot on at infinity. Then you can slacken your screws and move your ring round until the ring stops at the infinity position. Retighten your screws and you're in business. That's it. That's where it needs to be. Snip those screws up. Clean up these two components. And this tab couples to a slot in the lens right at the top. That locks that thing in position. Here's our retaining ring. We've just got two notches in this one. But I think I can get onto this with a uh, rubber friction tool. This is more awkward to start. That's it, started. You can see I'm using a wooden toothpick to poke, push that around. And that is so that it uh, let's check that's all tight. That's all good. Blow the dust off. That's our lens number three and I'll do one more session. I'll show you how you can adjust the focus on your rangefinder camera. Well that was fun. Now I suppose you want to know about how you actually go about adjusting the focus on one of these lenses. So I'll just remove the front cone from this lens. And the uh, name ring thing here. Look forward, I can get a grip on it. This one's a very neat fit. Okay, so this is what you've normally faced with before you adjust the focus on your camera. And this, I'm talking about adjusting the focus on your Zenar. Kodak uh, Retina Zenar 50mm f2.8 lens and here particularly we're on the Retina 3S camera. Okay so basically your adjustment for focus in the lens is to adjust the position of your focus scale ring relative to this black ring here, the outer helical. And you do that by loosening these three screws and washers up, moving the focus scale ring relative to that black helical ring, retightening the screws in the correct position. And of course there's a bit of toing and froing as you try and work out what the correct position will be. But basically that's where you make your adjustments. And it's probably worth stating here now that making a focus adjustment on one of these lenses doesn't affect the rangefinder in any way at all. And that's because the rangefinder coupling is to the mount 
not the lens capsule. It's to the cam inside the back here, which is a fixed distance to the mount and it can't change where it is. And all we can change in the way here is we can change the focus of the lens, changing the focus of the image cast on the film. So what gear do we need to adjust the focus? Well, first of all, we need a target, a screen at the film plane. A ground glass screen or equivalent needs to sit on these rails. Those bright aluminium rails. It does not sit on these black pieces in the middle. That's below. That, that sits low and that sits low so that it doesn't come in contact with the film. The film rides on these rails. That's where our ground glass screen needs to be. So what do we use as a ground glass screen? So ignore the lawn mowing man away in the distance. Here's a selection of ground glass screens that I've got which I might use to uh, adjust the focus on the camera. This one, nice one, it's got a split image in the middle. Fine ground glass, this came out of an exacta camera. If you had an exacta you could just lift your focus screen out of it it's like this and use this. Complication number one. Where do we put it? Obviously it's going to fall in if we try and hold it horizontal completely because it's slightly smaller. But if we hold it there, centred up on the aperture and sitting on the straight rails, not sitting up on those little cutouts, sitting up on the rails themselves, we hold it there, that's at the film plane, that'll work nicely. This one. This is one I made for my convenience. This was the focus screen out of a Retina Reflex 4 camera, I believe. This isn't glass, this is hard plastic. Faced with the same problem, having to hold it at an angle like this, somewhat unstable, in order to use it, what I did was I ground off both ends of this. As I say, it was plastic, it's not uh, glass ground those off so that it would sit between these rails top and bottom. So it sits on the aluminium rails, so it's sitting in the correct position, but it's much easier now because it's quite firm, I can hold that thing there. And um, if I want to, I can put a rubber band around the camera to hold it in position. And that works quite well for me, it makes a good focus target. So one of the things about the ground glass is the ground glass is very good. If you've got good eyesight, you've got a good high contrast target, you can judge the focus on the ground glass surface quite well. The split image that you see here, which is the focus aid from the SLR, that's even better. That works, it makes it much easier to adjust your focus. It's much easier to tell when you have the images aligned in that split image. What other ones have we got? Well here's a screen that's come from some uh, SLR, something, uh, it's plastic again, most screens you get these days will be plastic, again it's too small it would just fall into the hole if I try and used it like that, but using it diagonally across like that, that works fine. The disadvantage of using a thin plastic one like this is if you're holding it firmly with your finger you might be flexing it, so it might not be sitting where you expect it to be, but this will certainly work. Don't ask me what SLR that came from, I've got no idea. I've got another one here, this came from some autofocus monster, that's pretty useless. And another one here taken from an SLR. Whichever one of these ones you use, make sure that the ground glass surface is pointing in towards the lens. If you've got the screen on back to front, you're going to get some funny results. Now one thing you need to be aware of and watch for, this screen is an example, it's an interchangeable screen from some camera, some SLR, it's not dead flat, the edges are raised so that when it sits on something the actual ground glass surface is going to be sitting back behind that raised edge. Don't use a screen that's got a raised edge, that'll throw you out. So with all that said and done, 
You'll be on the hunt to find a focus screen stolen from an SLR, I would imagine. And if you can get a plastic one like this, um, or like this, all you've got to do is chew the ends of it down so that it'll fit between these rails. So it's sitting on these alum, parallel aluminium rails here. And that's going to be sitting at the film plane. And that'll work nicely for you. So what's the method? Well the method's fairly simple. Basically what you need to do is use a cable release. Ideally you want a cable release with some sort of lock on it. This one's handy because it, it locks automatically and you press that to release it. You need to open the shutter on B. You need your lens at full aperture, whatever it happens to be, f2.8 in this case, and then you're ready to go. So, quick review of the procedure. Lens is back on the camera, you'd want your shutter set to B, your aperture set to f2.8. You take your cable release, screw it on the top. This one locks, self locks, you may have one that you need to run a screw on the side to lock it. You can see through there the shutter is open, the aperture is fully open, that's what you want before you try adjusting the focus. Take your chosen focus screen, in this case I'm using this one, take your jeweler's eye loop, stuff this in your eye, hold the camera up to view a suitable infinity target. I've got some power poles off on the horizon here, work very well for me. And basically use that and you're trying to get it, adjust your focus so that just at the point that the focus scale ring reaches the infinity stop, that is just the point at which your images converge when viewing an infinity target. Now. In some cases you may want to put a, uh, a rubber band across there to hold that screen in place. It depends how you, well you can manipulate all your fingers and thumbs all at the same time, but I usually don't bother with that. As I say, your adjustments are made here. Normally, if I'm setting it up roughly, I'll set it up so that the focus goes beyond the infinity point, and at that Point. When it's set up like that, you just need to view your screen, move your focus scale ring round until the images exactly align, loosen the three screws, hold that black ring from moving, and then move your focus scale ring round to the infinity stop, do your three screws back up tight, and the job is done always go back and check after you've made the adjustment to make sure that you've actually done it right that you have picked the point that the images do align just at the point the focus scale ring reaches the infinity position and you're good to go do you need to use an infinity target no you can use a closer target if that suits you better and it may well do depending on where you are and what you can see you can use a computer screen with a suitable high, uh, high contrast target image on it, in which case you would choose a close focus distance. This one's scale is marked in feet, so I might choose 8 feet or 6 feet. And then I would measure the distance from the camera, from the film plane of the camera back about where my finger is, out to the screen. Measure it with a tape measure. Make sure you've got that right. You'd need to have the camera firmly mounted on a tripod so that you can be sure that you're not moving in and out while you're trying to adjust things. And if you get the focus correctly placed for a close distance, whatever it might happen to be, that'll be fine at the infinity end. You've got more depth of field at the infinity end than you have at the close focus distance. So you can get it aligned pretty much anywhere on the scale as long as your 
marking matches the distance of your film plane to the target that you're focusing on. Next I'll show you how I've got this set up on a, on a tripod out outside looking at the target that I use which was a bit entertaining. So here's the setup I use. I've got the focus screen here that's taken from an SLR. It's got a split image component right in the middle of the screen. It's ground glass to the forward of course on the film plane. Now this screen needs to be sitting on these aluminium rails here. That's where your film sits. The pressure plate on the camera back holds the film trapped between the pressure plate and those rails. Those rails are where your focus screen needs to be, not this black piece in the middle. That's set lower. That clears the film. If the film was touching on that black piece, you'd be almost inevitably, you'd end up with what they call tram lines on your film, longitudinal scratches running along the film, and you certainly don't want those. I would use a jeweler's loop to view the focus screen so I can check that things are at the point of correct focus and make my adjustments to the lens or the focus helical depending on the camera accordingly. In the distance that you can just about see on the focus screen on the back of the camera here is the target I use and I've got a group of power poles up on the horizon and there's a white flagpole further down the hill. Both of them make useful targets for checking the infinity position and uh, I can judge by how well my images converge on both the more distant power poles and the closer flagpole how well I've got that focus adjusted. Okay you can see in the centre of the screen the split image. I've got that running across my infinity target which is up on the horizon ahead of me some distance and a group of power poles and as I move the focus lever away from the infinity position you'll see that those vertical lines diverge. I'll do it a bit more. You can see those images diverge as I move that back to the infinity position. The images will converge and we've got nice straight lines again. Now that's how I check the focus. And here I'm checking the focus on my Retina Zen R 50mm f2.8 lens on a Retina 3S camera. But the same process is used for checking the focus on pretty much any lens. So with the uh, focus now correctly adjusted, I can put this ring back in place. This one's a little bit entertaining because everything's a little bit bashed about, so it's a very, very neat fit. It's not the lawnmower man after all in the background, it's the council busy digging up the road. There's a uh, break in a water pipe out there that they're dealing with. Right, so that's down. I didn't even need to use a toothpick to turn that into position. Now I'll take my friction tool and just nip that up. Check that everything moves freely still. And we're in business. That lens is correctly focused and everything's good to go.